similarly, I thought that writing was one of those jobs that would, you know, real people don't get to do that. So I became a teacher. Um, I just interrupt. What year level? Do you did you prefer teaching? So, um, so I'm trained to teach five to twelve year olds, and it's ironic that I started writing for sort of seven plus, and now I'm writing for ten plus, and seem to be getting older because kindergarten is my favourite year to teach. I really enjoy that, and so. Um, but I, every time I start planning a book, it, I realise what horrible things I'm going to do to my characters and think, well, maybe they should be a little bit older. So I think there would, I would get letters if I was actually writing for kindergarten children because it would be horrifying for them. So you grew up in Australia? Yeah, um, and I, so my parents are both now working as, as teachers in local school so I guess that's kind of the family trade and so I um, I did the whole teacher thing and I got out and I was um, I was teaching for a year and then I was speaking to a friend of mine uh, Rowan McCauley who's an author of I assume some of you may be familiar with the Go Girl series which is something yeah. that I'm not sure anyway it's it's sort of a this the sister series to Zach so if Zach is for boys which I'm not sure that necessarily is then Go Girl is the girl of the world. So she was writing for that. And she told me we would um, we would quite often chat after church. We'd go to the same church together back in Sydney about writing and, and all of that because she was a writer. And I thought, like, I know it's impossible to be a writer, but you are one. So I'll talk <laughs> to you and see what I can figure out. Um, and one day she just said, just offhand, oh, they're looking for authors for the Zach Power series. And I said, oh, good. What's that? Um, and so I went and I found out what Zach Power was, and it turned out that Zach was this 12-year-old spy who every book had 24 hours to save the world and do some mundane chore. And, uh, in the school holidays, I read a couple of the books, and then I had a go at writing my own. And I sent this manuscript about Zach Power getting kidnapped and taken, taken inside a volcano to my friend Rowan, and Rowan sent it to Hilary Rogers at Heidi Grant Egmont. And I thought, well, that was a nice little you know, dabbling in this thing that I once thought I wanted to do. And then two weeks later, I'm sitting in a staff meeting and I get this phone call and it's Hillary saying, hey, Chris, we like your book. Why can you have the next one ready? <laughs> and that's how I became an author, which is ridiculous. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know why I keep telling that story because it, it makes people angry. And if I wasn't me, I'd be angry too. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just, I feel like I will, hopefully that will be a really good buffer against me ever becoming sort of arrogant and pretentious because I didn't earn it. It was just this just gift that was handed to me on a platter. And so I'm so <coughs> grateful to be able to do what I do, but it's not um, by any stretch something that I feel like I've, you know, done the hard yards and earned this and I'm you know, I'm whatever the opposite of a self made man is, that's what I am. <laughs> but I would I would I would argue that actually you did because you were given an opportunity and you took it and you followed through and you did it and then I understand you you then said hey I've got this other idea with the Phoenix mm. file mm. and you did it so um, I know lots of situations and as a teacher and having a writing group I'll often um, show to kids that I see who have potential and say this would be a good thing for you to do this would be a good thing for you to do and most of them don't do it and I just want to put a plug out there that um, Chow Lin who won the Catherine Mansfield was was mine, and, and she she was the one that I said, this needs to go into the Catherine Mansfield, but we need to work on it. But but there are other kids that I've said that who go, oh, I've got to go and do more polo or something like that. So actually, you could have gone, oh, that's nice, and then done nothing with it. Well, I guess my great strength is that I'm no good at water polo. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it really was one of those situations where a lot of things lined up. Yeah. You know, I was in the right place at the right time, and I knew the right people and I happened to write in the style that people... So the comment that I got was, wow, you've really captured Zach's voice. And I just thought to myself, oh, that's interesting. I think that's just my voice. You know, I think I just regressed to 12-year-old Chris, which was not that much of a regression. And, and just wrote from there. Um, and so, yeah, and, and the Phoenix Files was, I guess, the next logical step because Zach was under the H.A. Larry pseudonym, and at that point we weren't allowed to talk about um, the fact that we'd written the books, it was all this big industry secret, and so I would have these weird experiences in bookshops where 
they'd be sort of browsing through the young adult section and behind it would be kids at the kids section saying, wow, Zach Power, you know, and I'd turn around and they were holding this book that I wrote and I'm like, this is a very odd situation to not even be able to claim that and not even be able to have a conversation. Because I would have gone running going, strange man in the children's aisle. Well, well that's it. <laughs> no, no, it's, I wrote that, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, and so... Um, but 12 books is a lot. It is. Well, the, the analogy that I use is uh, when I'm visiting schools, is I say to the kids, how many of you have got a younger brother or sister who, you know, you love them? Deep down you love them, but when you're in a car with them for a long period of time, or you're stuck on a plane flight or something, there comes a point where you're just like, I, seriously, I love you, but we need some space. Like, this is, someone's going to kill someone if we don't get apart soon. And that, and you know, of course every kid puts their hand up, and, and that to me was how I felt about Zach. You know, I still loved it. I thought that, that Zach Power was a really great series for what it was. But we needed some space. He was the little brother that I needed some space from. And so the Phoenix Files was basically born out of this big pile of notes that I generated every time I wanted to do something in Zach. That the editorial feedback was, no, that's too complicated, too scary, too dark, too complicated, too whatever. And slowly all of that started to take shape into the Phoenix Files. And I picked that. And they... I, I remember this, this moment... I, they'd fly me down to Melbourne to discuss the Mega Missions, which was this four book Zach Power series, which was a new thing, so they brought me down to a workshop. And so I took down this Phoenix Files proposal and I gave it to Hillary, um, who is, I guess, my boss. Is, um, she, so the publisher, the person who gets to decide whether these things get written or not. And she looked at the proposal, she said, oh, cool title. She lifted it up, put it back down. Shoved it aside and said, okay, so about Zach. And I was like, oh, all right, well, that went well. Um, and then maybe two, three months later, um, she was sending me some other email about Zach Power, and there was this PS that was, oh, by the way, did I mention that you should start thinking about the Phoenix Files as being six books? I meant to. <laughs> and I went, that, I think you buried the lead on that one. <laughs> And so that had been, you know, the number that I had been playing around with too, and I had this, this story mapped out. And so we'd been sort of talking a little bit back and forth earlier on about how many books is it going to take to tell this story. And it was a difficult thing. I think it was a bit of a paradigm shift for them because Zach and Gurgle and the other things that they had done previously is you get to the end of the book, everything sort of resets back to the way it was. Um, and the Phoenix House is the complete antithesis of that. There was this much story. Um, and at, at some point they were saying, you know, why don't you just write this many and we'll see how it goes. And then if it does well, we can write more. And I said, well, it kind of, it either has to be this many and out or it needs to be um, this many and with the possibility of it never getting finished. Because as far as I was concerned, I mean, the, the whole premise is there are 100 days till the end of the world. And so there comes a point where we get down to day zero and there's no more story. And so it was all a matter of figuring out what the best way was to convey that story. And in the end, I think six books has, has well, so far, has worked out. All at, right. at the moment, my um, year 13, which is your year 12. Okay. Yeah, so for old people, that's seven form. Um, are doing uh, research and they have to investigate um, a language or a literature topic. And um, a number of the kids are looking at... A classical classical story, what makes a classical story and the, the writers who break the rules and yet they're not breaking the rules, they're going back to stuff that was earlier on and I was talking to a student today about that and then thinking about um, the rules that you've broken for me, which I'm not going to tell them about because that makes me look bad, but I actually think it's very clever. Um, the six series thing, so I, you know, I'm in the middle of trying to write the last in a trilogy and I was charged with, even though it was a trilogy, each book had to yeah. complete in itself. So if I think about uh, Ben Cross's um, Luther series, um, which is a television series, which my husband and I really like, there's a continual thread of a story, but each episode ends a, ends a story. Um, the Phoenix Files doesn't do that, but that's actually very much like which is a bit of a cliche, like Dickens, when 
when he first wrote, it was serialised, and you had to wait till the next time to do that, and that, that, is, that is acceptable. The other thing that I had actually just said to the class at the beginning of the term, when, because they were doing writing, this is another group, you do not use onomatopoeia um, in your story. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be showing them the books. And then I thought, okay, okay. My husband over there, the bald one, yeah, with the glasses, um, one of the men has <laughs> He's a comic reader. We had thousands of comics in our house. I like reading comics too. And I thought, you must read comics. You, you must like comics. Do you like comics? I'm making an assumption. Um, I do. I think I like... I, so one of the big influences on, I guess in terms of the voice and the writing style, was Animorphs, which was a series that was... Um, which, similarly to the Phoenix Files, probably would have been viewed by many people as sort of, you know, trashy popular fiction rather than, you know, fiction of substance. But I really loved it because I thought that it was, um, it, it just had that, that same, it had a sort of a TV, like a, mm. a, a film sort of sensibility in terms of the way that things were described. It had a, it was sort of cinematic um, and that involved the use of onomatopoeia. You know, involved a lot of these things and one bit of feedback that I often get from readers is that your book is like watching a movie. Yeah, I which challenge in series. I, it is very visual. I could see it being a TV series. Have you got it? Have you signed the contract? With it? I haven't, no. And, and I don't know that I, what I would feel about that. But I, I have a very, I guess, you know, I have a lot of books that are really influential, but a lot of TV shows and things are really influential for me as well. Lost is a massive touchstone series. Um, it's and it's put that down there. Very lost-ish, I said. But we'll talk so, about them later, yeah. So, uh, and so that was, that's something that, and you know, even things like, uh, not in terms of um, subject matter or anything like that, but Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I was a big fan of in high school, and it just had this, it created this, um, this cast of characters that were going through all of this ridiculous, you know, nonsensical almost stuff, but they were real and you cared about the characters and so you're quite happy for them to be, you know, shooting a bazooka at a vampire demon thing because that's not the point. The point is that she's in love with him and she has to save him and, and, and that sort of stuff that is just very real and very human. Um, and so the concept for me, and this was in my the original proposal for the Phoenix Files, and very central to me in, in conceiving the series was, this is not a series about the end of the world, this is a series about three kids responding to the end of the world. And I feel like for as long as my readers care about them, they'll care about the rest of the stuff. Um, but if you can't, if there's no human element there, then, I mean that's what to me makes so many blockbuster movies today so pointless and so... Um, kind of in one ear and out the other, is that it's just a bunch of stuff exploding. But who cares? Because we don't care about any of the characters. So that's something that I've really tried to get away from. Now talking about the characters, and I'd like to move on here and actually just focus on the Phoenix um, Files, if you like, because that's what I'm reading and my head's in it. Um, so the, 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 I'm um, coming towards the end of book four, and I've got book five there. I have to wait. Have you? No, no, I haven't got book no, five. I've come yeah. to the end. I've oh, got three. I've got book four oh, there. That's good. <laughs> 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 Basically, you want to do 
the worst thing possible that you can think of to your character and then see how they get out of it or see how it affects them. Um, the other thing that I was thinking um, was you know, the current trend is utopia and in fact many of the shortlisted books at the New Zealand Post and in the Lianza were utopian stories. I wouldn't call this a utopian story because to me it's real. It's probably could possibly, it could already be happening, there could be something out there already in the Australian desert doing things. But how would you, do you know, getting things ready for the end of the world, how would you, what, where would you put the action, social realism, would you, can you pigeonhole it? Well, I, I never said I'm going to sit down and write this kind of story, you know, I, I, and I certainly didn't think dystopia is really hot right now, I'll write one of them. Um, I just let the story be what it was, and something that, um, so I, at an event a few months ago I ran into these two 12 year old twin girls who keep a blog and they asked if they could interview me and one of the questions that they asked, I just finished answering them earlier in the week, was compared to other end of the world type books, we find that yours are full of hope. Can you, do you want to talk about that? And I thought that was such an interesting question because I think the trend in dystopia is they're tragedies, they're, they're these bleak worldviews and they're, they're presenting these worlds where things are really wrong and it's sort of how do you survive in a world where everything is wrong. Um, and I can totally see why that's, that resonates with kids today because it is like the world is scary. And the world is, you know, you turn on the news and there's there's floods and fires and earthquakes and wars and famines and, and all of this stuff. And it's right there and it's real. And so to be able to um, escape into a fictional world and sort of experience that through somebody else's eyes can be a really cathartic experience, I think. Um, but I feel like if there's anything that I want to do differently, in terms of that, it was that I wanted to provide a sense that yes, the, the darkness is real, yes, the pain is real, yes, the violence and the, and the suffering is real, and that's all bad, but maybe that's not all it is. Maybe there's a bigger picture, maybe there's a bigger story being told. And so that, if the Phoenix Files is saying <coughs> anything, and I I don't think they're preachy books, but what, but what I want to suggest is that possibly you know, you can look at the dark. I think, you know, there is, I think we do all have, there's darkness in the world where we live, and there's darkness certainly within, sight, within all of us. And, but, if that's the whole story, then that's really horrible and depressing, and I believe it is. And so it's, it's, I guess one of the big questions hanging over these characters is, how will I live in the face of a world that is deeply broken? Because I feel like that's the question of all of us. And it's quite a hard doing. question for 15 year olds to, to, to think about. We, we this year, um, in our community, we've lost a couple of teenagers that are well known within, within, our, within our community. And the shock of the friends at schools, various schools, because the schools are quite, the kids know each other over the place, is that being reminded, and with the Christchurch Youth quote, and we've had a lot of kids come down and, and re relocate, and just the realisation that the world is not necessarily as stable as one would like, and yet the resilience is there, because they look for, okay, so where, where's that hope, where's that, where do I go next? Well, I think it's about the illusion of control. So, I mean, one, one character that I've had a lot of fun writing, and, and she's not a major character is Luke's mum. Luke's mum at the start of the series is this high-flying businesswoman. Um, she's just divorced her husband and she's got... She, the reason they had come to Phoenix in the first place is because Luke, Luke's mum has got this great job. And she's total career woman, total, um, like, job first. And to, to the expense of her relationship with her son. Um, but she's all very much about controlling her situation, controlling her life, making life work. And then eventually there comes a point where she has to come face to face with the reality of what is going on in Phoenix and the reality that her life is totally outside of her control. And so it's been really interesting for me writing that and, and just exploring what do you do when your whole life is built around control, you know, when your whole life is built around making life work and you realise that you're completely incapable of making life work on your own. How do you react? And so things like that to me are really 
worth exploring because those things, those questions resonate really deeply with me because I think there's a degree to which we're all that person. The person who sort of pushes out the signs that things spin out of control and, and we sort of create these neat little organized universes for ourselves. And so to be able to, um, to look at, put someone in a situation where theirs gets blown apart and say, okay, what now? The, um, for me, when I do that to my characters, I learn. Mm. And, and, and um, one of the questions that I've had to hear, you talked about planning out the whole story. Mm. And I'm, I'm one of those writers as well. Um, I've, you know, I've planned, planned the whole trilogy. But one of the things that I've happened is, one of the things that happens in the writing is the characters begin to be quite disobedient or, or people turn up that you didn't think were going to turn up, or there's twists. Now I know that you've said, you know, you, you, planned, you planned the six, you knew the arc of the story and the sections, and you just got down to the business of writing them. Mm -hmm. In the process of that happening, were there shifts, were there surprises, were you, was there developments that you didn't anticipate? Um, the main architecture of the story is still very much in place, and I think I've been setting up the fifth and sixth book from book one, and so on one level, I locked myself in from the very beginning because there's only one way that all of these loose plot threads can cohere and hopefully make sense by the end. I'm hoping that I do manage to pull that off. Um, <laughs> but there are, there, there, I'm, I'm confident that it will make some level of sense by the end. Um, but there is, there is very much the sense of it being a fluid entity as well. So within that architecture, within that sort of grand narrative, there are characters that play much bigger roles than I'd anticipated or smaller roles than I'd anticipated. There were some characters who were in the story to fulfill a specific function and now that function's happened and I think, oh, well, what if, like, what would they do next? Mm -hmm. well, and so some of that is quite, um, quite fluid as well. And so I think you've got to, I mean, I've heard, um, you know, the analogy of listening to your story of, of you need to let the story. And whenever I hear writers think, like, talk about their characters as if they're real, or talk about their, you know, as though I tried to do this, but my character did that. Or but, Excuse me. Yeah, Excuse but, me. There's a there's a degree to which it really is. If you're being once you've created a character who is hopefully authentic on some level, it's not so much that I, I think. What I mean when I say those things is that is not that I literally, you know, an unseen force was controlling yeah. my hand, but that having created a character who behaves in certain ways, I come to these places where the plot calls for them to do this, but I think, well, they wouldn't do that. And so one time, uh, my three main characters, Peter, Luke, and Jordan, were having this argument, and I had down in this chapter this crucial piece of plot information that had to come up in discussion. And then I was I was writing it, and I was like, "Oh, he's not going to stick around. He's storming out." And so he did. And so I wrote another chapter the next day where they come back and apologize, and then they carry on the discussion. Because I think, you know, I've talked a lot about characters already, but I think the minute that your characters are not true to who they've been all along, then that is what drags you out of the story and, and makes it feel like the plot is dictating the characters. Really, it should be the other way around. Mm -hmm. We'll have some time for questions. Um, um, so, we'll writing. Um, so, two other questions that writers always get asked um, is your writing routine. Um, I understand that you're relieved at you know, not because the demands of this. You know, well, it's been, it's uh, like you can look at five different bios and find five different explanations of what kind of teeth I am, and that's because it's changed quite a lot over the, you know, over the past few years. At the moment, I'm essentially writing full-time, and this is going to disgust anybody whose goal this is, but I don't want to keep doing that. Like, I, w I would really love to move back in and do a bit of part-time teaching, and so I'm hoping that I'll have some sort of scope to do that in the future, just because I found that it's very hard to be self-disciplined with the writing, as much as I love it when that's all I do. It just my, because there's there's no distinction between this is work and this is writing time, because there's never a time when I couldn't pull out the laptop and type. 
and there's never a time where I couldn't just put it away and you know go for a walk because I don't have anybody telling me when to start and stop. And so I find that I'm, that where the teaching is really helpful is in terms of my writing is in creating a rhythm in my life and creating. And I think rhythm is really important because otherwise it's just a constant sort of blur of activity. And I'm really this year as I'm doing it full time, I've had to find other ways of of building. Routine into my life, but I think yeah, if I if I do go back to teaching, that'll sort of force routine into my life because I'll suddenly have a whole lot less time. But I have a feeling I might actually be a bit more productive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think I mean people often ask me the question because I would I be would I become a full time writer um, if I could get paid my teaching salary? I wouldn't mind, um, but I do find and I don't know if you found this with teaching is the kids fill me up. Yeah. They fill me with words yeah. and stories and ideas and energy and, and I need that, I find that as a writer that helps with my creativity. Um, when you see yourself in 20 years, because that means you'll be my age. <laughs> I don't know. Well, what's your writing bucket list? Okay, have you got a bucket list? Um, no, I, I, if there's one thing I've learned about my life is that I have no hope of predicting where it's headed. So, I mean, five years ago, if you'd asked me what I'd be doing, it wouldn't be this. Like, I, I could not have seen this coming. And so, I have other things that I'd like to write. I have lots of ideas, and particularly um, having basically this sort of, what will eventually be, I guess, four or five years working on the Phoenix Files. That's a lot of time coming up with ideas for things that aren't the Phoenix Files and putting them aside. So, I'm... I'm imagining this day when the Phoenix Files is done and I go to my drawer full of ideas and they're all the, you know, and I go through and I think, oh, there's ten stories in here. I don't know if it'll work out that way because a lot of my ideas that I come up with on the fly I look back on and realise how ridiculous they are. But I think I have a sense of a few different projects that I'd like to tackle in the future. But at the moment, um, it's just the Phoenix Files is kind of on my mind. And I, I'm not, I mean, I love hearing from kids about the books. I love doing stuff like this where I get to talk to you guys and you all sit there and don't fall asleep and you kind of smile like maybe I'm a bit interesting. And that's all, you know, that's really fun. But I also, I don't, I'm not interested in conquering the world and being a famous person either because I think that society has such a weird idea of being, like fame being this incredible thing. And I just, you know, I want to be able to go down to the cafe without, get, I mean, not that I'm in any danger of, <laughs> the paparazzi coming out with their telephone. <laughs> and I, you know, I honestly I don't really see that happening, but I would never, I would never want it to. And, it, and it's, oh, it's funny. So I was in school, um, went into school at lunch time a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, and all of these year two girls who um, I've known half their lives, you know, I've been around the school for you know, as long as most of them have been alive, and they they all came up to me with pens and paper saying, Mr. Morphew, Mr. Morphew, can we get your autograph? And I was just, you know, I looked at them and I said, hang on, what's going on here? You know, you know who I am. And they're like, no, no, you're famous, you're famous now. And I said, but no, I'm not. You, I mean, you know, I'm here every week, what's going on? And eventually it came out that um, one of them had received a magazine in the mail that I'd been interviewed in, and so this of course qualified me as a bona fide famous person because Justin Bieber was in there too, so you know, I don't know if that's good company to be keeping or not, but in their heads, like, I've made it, you know, I'm famous. Yeah. And I just think it's so weird that they think that's a big deal because everything in reality that I am to them that is not a product of my famousness, it's a product of me as a human being. And so I, and I, I said to them, you know, I've, you've got my signature at the bottom of your handwriting book or in your homework or, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And so all of that, I just think, well, you know, you've got it. But it's just, it's funny that there's just, it's almost as though, to them, there's two Mr. Morpheus. There's Chris Morphy, the famous author, and then there's Mr. Morphy, the normal guy, who we like, but he's not famous or anything. So it's, it's, it's almost as though they can't reconcile those two things. I had another kid in year five come up to me with her copy of um, the third Phoenix Files book. And she was like, I just wanted to tell you that I, you know, I really liked your book. And this is a kid who's totally boisterous and totally, you know, will chat to me all the time. But when she's talking about the book, it's like she's approaching this different person. 
and you, she had all these pages dog eared, all these like 50 different pages folded down. I said, Oh, are you keeping your place there? And she said, Oh, no, those are all the bits that I think are important. And I thought, <laughs> You know, that's awesome. Like, that's my ideal reader who folds down the corners of the pages because they're trying to figure out what's going on. But at the same time, the whole famous Mr. Morky thing is mystifying to me because I'd make the worst famous person. <laughs> the thing is, is that it doesn't change when they get older because today, last period, the, the, my year 12s, which is your year 11, like, what are you doing? Are you doing something? Someone said something, you're doing something tonight. And I said, oh yeah, I'm being a famous author person tonight. And they're going to get, you know, like, what? You're uh, Mrs. Roxbury. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I said, I'm talking to another famous author. Who? What? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel that I could keep on having chats like this for ages, so I'm going to think of the next time I have to introduce you, or I could say, um, not about your unshave because I can't smell it at this stage, but I would like to open um, the floor up to um, questions. Um, before I do say that, I don't know if it was you that said it to me, but somebody of um, equal importance and weight in education, and I don't know if you've been told this, is um, that um, Chris Morphew has got um, librarians and teachers excited because um, the boys in particular who read Zach Power have followed him to the Phoenix Files. And you made a comment about the animals, uh, kind of a derogatory comment about the uh, animals, and I, I haven't read animals, I think we've got some girls in the library, I think you've read them. Um, I, do think you're what you're writing, and I'm not being sycophantic. I think it is not rubbish stuff. It is it's good, good storytelling, and and I had to keep reading a couple of times over things. I was going, what? What just happened? What? And you know that's that's good writing, but it is. I, I kind of think there's this kind of bleat with trying to get kids to read books, and many of us here have listened to the guru um, who was Wayne Mills when it comes to reading and boys and reading and that sort of thing. And I think if the story is good. It doesn't matter how old you are, what gender you are. Um, if you're given an opportunity, you will read it. Um, I mean, I read mostly what you write, your type of stuff. My husband doesn't read what I write, but he reads what you write. He, sorry, I'm embarrassing you again. I'm going to get this when I get home. I'm no, no, he loves he loves boys' books, boys, you know, Percy Jackson. That's what they've been great, and great stories. There's my rent. And lost. And lost. lost. Oh, yeah, we love lost too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I did think, it, although Phoenix Files is not as confusing as Lost, I gave up on Lost. I hadn't given up on Phoenix Files. I feel as, I mean, I could talk a lot about Lost and probably bore most people here, but I think as much as I loved it and as much as it's you know, still my favourite TV show, I feel like I sort of, there were a few times where I went, you know, I'm not going to do that because I, I almost learned from the mistakes that they made there when they lost 90% of their audience in the second season. I thought maybe I didn't want to lose 90% of my audience in the they second lost, book. They lost me in the second season, and then Philip told me what happened in the end, and it was basically, and then it was all a dream. Oh, no, so, no, no, no. Oh. But the difference between what Chris has done and what Lost has done is that Lost in the first two seasons was at the mercy of the ratings. They right. did not know if they were going to continue to the third season, the fourth season, the fifth season. And it wasn't until they locked in a deal to get through the sixth season that the story came together. So I'm going to like talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas for you, you've locked the story down and you've been given an opportunity to yeah. write it. Yeah, and if I can just indulge the two of us for yes. a like, that was the thing that they, that was what the analogy that these guys always use, that the creator of that show always used was mm. Harry Potter. That J.K. Rowling always knew it was going to be set in books, so you knew how far you had to go. Mm. And the thing with Lost was, you were in the second season and you you just didn't know, was this going to be two seasons or ten? And so you didn't know how much you were investing in it. I think one of the things that has been really important for me is that I've always told the kids, or the teens, or the whoever reads my books, it's going to be six. There's going to be six books, and that's going to be the end. Whereas if I didn't give anyone any indication of that, I think people would have given up. Because cliffhangers are fun to a point, but if you, as soon as you start to get the sense that they're just stringing you along, then that's when it, it stops becoming, you know, an interesting storytelling technique. It just starts being opportunistic, I think. And so that was. And I think what what's good about them is that I can see that, like what happened with the Harry Potter, as, but as people were waiting, with film probably, but, but but as people were waiting, they went back and read again to remind them that, of what had happened. And I think the 
that that would be the beauty of when you get to the end and go, ah, oh. and then go back and say, right, ah, oh, that, oh, that bit, that bit, that bit, that bit, all the clues. Well, yeah, yeah, so I talked about loss being a person, and if there's another one, it's Harry Potter. Like, I think those two go hand in hand, because what I loved about Harry Potter is that you'd go and you'd, you'd read through the books and you'd read the third book about Sirius Black, the Godfather, and all this stuff, and then you'd go back to the first book, and Sirius is mentioned in the first chapter, and you go, oh my goodness, she knew all along. Yeah. And so I really hope that the Phoenix Files rewards repeat reading. Because I'm the sort of person who, um, before each Harry Potter book came out, I would read the whole series again, and then I'd read the new one. And then I'd be like, oh my goodness, I have to go back and read it all again. <laughs> because every book sort of recontextualized everything else. And I hope that that's what the Phoenix Files is doing now. And I, a few readers have, read, have written to me and said, you know, I went back and there was all this stuff that I noticed. And I love that experience as a reader of going back and going, oh, that's what was happening there. And I, was so, saying, I wondered if you had continuity, because there was a bit there where you talked about they had to scrape off the chewing gum. And I wondered how much chewing gum there would have been in Phoenix and what in a month. You teach in high schools. They can, like, fill a desk in... Yeah, but not my school. Uh, <laughs> what? Can I tell you? Yeah, I mean, not Phoenix. I mean, it didn't, didn't Luke say it was so plain, it didn't seem like a real school. There, there is, there's no um, underlying mystery there. There's no, you know, the, the chewing gum is not the answer to everything. So, <laughs> yeah. so don't worry about that. Although Mr. Hanger's is such a jerk, he probably put it there himself. Yeah, so he, he could spread it off. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I welcome all theories about where that chewing gum came from. It's never actually occurred to me. <laughs> Um, it's only because in my second book I lost a horse and no one picked it up until after it was published and, um, and you know, the continuity thing. So before I finish the third book I'm going to have to go back and read the first two and make sure okay. that... There are two things that hopefully no one will notice that I'm not going to bring them up here. Okay. But they're, they're, very, they're very minor and they're very... Even if people notice them I don't think they would care. But for me I was like, ugh, that's annoying. Um, and they're, they're just... You know, one sentence there. Hang on the casket. Yeah. Oh, what's wrong with that? I thought the casket was open. No, it was closed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'd like to open it up to the floor for questions. For him. I have one. Um, you said that, you know, the Zach thing was the first novel mm. you wrote. Did you ever write anything else before that? Was that the very first thing you ever wrote? Oh, I, I always have written and made up stories and you know, as a child it was switching on the tape recorder and, and making fake radio programs with my two cousins and um, there's always been some sort of, you know, I would write um, a serial drama for a church camp or I would write a, you know, this outline for this great novel that I will never write and, you know, all of these things. So it's always been storytelling I've always loved and so I think I, I had never sat down and written a complete novel, if you can call Zach a novel. Um, but I'd always, the structuring of stories and playing with language and all of those things I'd been doing pretty much for 20 years before I actually started writing. So, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a total fraud. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. You think? No. <laughs> so how long on average would it take you to write? One of these books, like the Zach books and then the thing. Well, the Zach book, I can, I um, have written first drafts in two or three weeks. So they're 7,000 word novels, so they're not huge. Um, and then there's a, a second draft and sometimes a third draft and all of that. So the, the whole process would be sort of four to six months. And then the Phoenix Files are more like 50, 60,000 words. So they're significantly longer and so that four months to write a first draft, and that's going faster than my liking just for the sake of, you know, appeasing the readers. And so I, I it's been, um, it's been interesting trying to find that balance between what's going to make me not have a nervous breakdown, but what's <laughs> going to make them not hate me, and what's going to work for the editorial staff, and, you know, so it's, um, and there's been a bit of elasticity with the release dates, but hopefully we've settled on. So theoretically, the next book comes out May next year and the other one comes out February 2013. So hopefully we can see to that, but I just am really bad at deadlines. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just uh, 
um, earlier when Tanya mentioned that um, kind of alluded towards a TV series or a, a film deal and you're like, not really sure how I feel about that. If someone did approach you with that, what would you insist on? Um, some level of creative control, not in the sense of wanting to do everything, but a kind of, I guess, right of veto. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm, I'm very protective of it and I think so few film adaptations or TV adaptations really um, work. I think uh, a lot of people criticised the Tomorrow When the War Began mm -hmm. movie. I thought that did a pretty good job of adapting the book. Um, I feel the Narnia movies make me furious because I feel like their philosophy is let's take out all of the nuance and replace it with green mist. <laughs> that, that to me was Voyage of the Dawn Tread and they, they just infuriate me. Um, Harry Potter, I thought the third one was brilliant because they actually had a director who had a vision for creating a work of art and not just an adaptation. And so I think that's what I would want. I would want somebody who had their own vision for the story and I'd be quite happy for them to sort of reimagine it so long as it was a coherent vision within itself and not just an adaptation. Because my feeling with a lot of... I mean, Harry Potter's a great example, I think, of movies that feel like selected scenes from the books brought to life in absolute literal detail, which is okay as far as it goes, but it, it's not a movie. So... <laughs> Didn't J.K. Rowling have Raj Vito over it? And, and actually, that might, that might explain actually why... Well, I, I think earlier on, the I, so the, the first two um, movies, I just I watched them and I thought, why bother? It's just like reading a book again, but not as good. The third one got criticised by the some of the mega fans for being, you know, deviating from the book too much. But I felt like it de deviated just enough to be coherent in and of itself. Um, and I've got my housemate um, asked if she could borrow the first Harry Potter DVD yet. So I brought out the DVD and the book and I said, look, I'm trusting you to make the right choice here. And <laughs> guilted her into reading the books. And now she loves them. And she's been watching the movies again and saying, these just make me angry now. But she got up to the third one and said, this is actually really be like, it's beautifully shot. If there's imagery, you know, imagine imagery in a movie. Like, I just, I think, I don't know, and this is a really long answer to a short question, but I, I feel as though a film is a different animal to a book and the aim of a film adaptation should not be to make it as much like the book as possible but to make it as much like if I would chosen from the get-go to make the Phoenix Files a movie that's what it would be like if I just gone I think you need to go back to the drawing board and build it all again so but I, 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 I don't see it happening for a long time <laughs> so we, we'll watch the space. Let me, let me give you a question. Well, Two-pronged question. Did you grow up in a storytelling family? And what did you read as you were growing up? Okay. I, I grew up in what was very much a book-loving family. My grandmother read to me. My mother read to me. My dad read to me. My dad... I have, I have these memories of these, like, these scrapbooks of these pictures from magazines pasted in through a scrapbook and my dad would go through and make up a new story every time. And so and we loved it as kids. My sister and I, you know, would go through that same book over and over again with a different story every time. And, and so I guess that sort of thing, and as I said before, my cousins were big storytellers too and we would put our heads together and come up with all of this bizarre stuff. Um, and I read a lot and was read to a lot. And so I think certainly story has been a part of my life. And I, I guess, um, just in terms of, of worldview and where I'm coming from more generally than that, I, um, like through church and things, I've always understood life in terms of narrative and I've understood, you know, the Bible as this grand narrative and I think there's a reason it's called the greatest story ever told. And, and so I feel like it was a logical step from reality to fiction because I, I viewed reality as being, having such the qualities of a narrative anyway, and so it just felt like a very natural step. Um, and that probably explains things like why. So I like, I resonate with things like um, Lost and Harry Potter and these stories where 
there was a design from the beginning and it all makes sense at the end and where the stories are about hope and redemption and where the stories are uh, this sort of meandering thing that you can't quite figure out where it's going but there comes this point where you go oh there was like it, in, in hindsight it all makes sense because I think that's very much the way that I view life um, other things that I read as a child um, probably all the, the movies that I was most angry about were because I loved the books so much so Narnia were books that I absolutely loved um, going back earlier than that like I have so I love picture books still you know the, all the classic ones like Where the Wild Things Are and um, The Very Hungry Caterpillar and things like that I really love and I think a lot of unlike sometimes unlike novels I feel like the picture books that have really lasted generally are the really good ones um and I don't know exactly, all my grandmother's old books, she was such a reader and she used to read uh, stories from her childhood, like My Naughty Little Sister and all of this stuff, which I love still. And so, I mean, it was just a huge mixed bag. You know, I used to take encyclopedias to school in year one and read them because I liked the pictures of the dinosaurs and I liked the pictures of the, the monkeys and whatever. And so it's just been... I, I've never done any writing training. I've never... Um, done a writing course or a writing degree or, or anything like that. It's all just been osmosis. It's been that my life has been so immersed in story that I just feel my way through. Um, and like, so my whole writing career has just been faking it essentially. But I feel like I can fake it well because I've seen so many other people do it for real. Um. Chris, I sort of feel that anyone who writes for kids or teenagers gets sort of two forms of criticism. You get the usual literary criticism, mm -hmm. and then there's the extra criticism, which comes from people who have a particular interest in protecting kids mm. or young readers from what they should or shouldn't read. Do you encounter much of that? Is that a problem, a feature in writing for kids in Australia? I feel as though the general mood of young adult at the moment is so dark and so bleak that my books seem kind of cheery by comparison. Um, and I think that, um, if you'll permit me to name drop for a moment, uh, when Michael Grant, the author of Animals and Gone, came out last year, we had these, um, we got to catch up and I got to meet him, which is really surreal because he'd written these books that I read growing up and now you're just chatting as, you know, author to author. And he... Um, you know, obviously his Gone series is really bleak and really dark and really, for those of you who haven't read it, there it's basically if Stephen King wrote Lord of the Flies, which I can't imagine anything much more grim than that. Um, and so, and his sort of, his view was very much, well, the kids can handle it, you know, give them whatever. Um, I... I don't think I censor them. I want the books to feel authentic, but there are certain play points at which... So, obviously, if Peter was a real 15-year-old, he would swear yeah, a lot more than he currently... And so I tried to find that balance of making him sound like his rat bag 15-year-old, but also without putting stuff out there that's, that's unnecessary. I, it's striking that balance between writing something that I'd be happy for the kids that I teach to read, but also being authentic and not... And so there is a lot of violence in my books. Um, and I think that... You know, it's interesting. I've been to a couple of... Um, I've been invited out to a couple of Christian schools back home who have... Um, you know, the, and there's a kid that puts up their hand and says, you know, how come there's so much violence in, in your books? Because, you know, doesn't Jesus say, you know, turn the other cheek and, and whatever? And, and, and I, my response is always, yeah. Um, he also likes honesty. And, and to me, it's really important that I'm honest about the way the world is. And I think the way that we, um, that we deal with the brokenness in the world should not be from pretending it's not there and it shouldn't be um, by sheltering people who are able to deal with it away from it and so I'd much rather say yes the world is dark yes the world is violent yes evil people do evil things and yes there is darkness inside all of us but we all have the potential to do horrible things 
but the darkness and the death and the depravity are not the whole story. And maybe the only way out of, the, of all of that is through. Maybe there's a, a bigger story being told, and maybe it'll be a case of the bad stuff was used, was turned around and, and turned into something good. And so, if at whatever point I do get criticism for being too dark, too bleak, too whatever, my answer is generally wait until the story is finished and then judge me on based on that. Mm -hmm. And often kids don't notice. Like, I remember Bill Taylor got criticised for. Well, wasn't it? Maybe it was the one that you, you, and he did, Tessa. Was it Hotmail, the one with the swearing? No, oh, there was a bit of swearing in there. Yeah. Not, not too much. Well, it's no, one that Bill did that had a bit of swearing in it. Land of Milk and Honey. That's right. Land of Milk and Honey. And, you know, people up in arms about it. And I had a kid who really he didn't even notice. Mm. Didn't I think even most notice. People I think swearing is a bizarre thing for yeah. people to get hung up on in terms of books. I mean, of all. I, and that's. You know, it's funny to me that you can cut someone's head off, but you can't swear at them before you do it. <laughs> and I think, honestly, what's the worst, yeah. the worst crime there? Well, I'm going to wrap that up tomorrow. Um, Tessa will be um, doing a panel with David and myself and Chris and a very interesting topic. I don't know who came up with it. I've been really asking the question is who, who's better to write <laughs> books for, for teenagers? Teenagers or adults? Very interesting question. Or adults in a state of arrested development. I don't know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>